Dude, that is actually sick. I'll never forget June 11th, 2020. This was the day that OpenAI released their GPT-3 model. Now this shook up the entire tech world because it was so, so powerful. It was a huge NLP model that was able to handle a whole heap of different tasks from summarization to translation to writing copy. People were using this for a whole bunch of different types of applications and they were having amazing success, namely because the model was so big and had such a ridiculous number of parameters, it was able to generalize to a whole heap of different use cases. Now, the sucky thing is I never got access. So when the OpenAI team went and demoed OpenAI Codex a couple of weeks ago, I decided we needed to go and check this out. Now, OpenAI Codex is a refined version of the big GPT-3 model called DaVinci, but specifically fine-tuned to generate code. This means that you could pass through a string to be able to do something in terms of code, and the DaVinci Codex model would be able to generate that code, whether it be Python or JavaScript or Java the codex model is able to handle it. Now this is the same model that powers GitHub Copilot and it was actually proven or estimated to be able to convert a doc string, think of this as a natural bit of text, to functional code 28.8% of the time. Now this could be a complete game changer, particularly when it comes to the no code revolution. Everybody's all about these no code tools that allow you to drag and drop different components to be able to do certain things and build applications this could be a complete revolution. Ideally, it would allow people without coding skills to be able to enter in a string specifically for what they want and have the code generated for them. Not exactly no code, but ideally getting further towards that state. Now this begs the question for all the coders out there, what about us? Could Codex replace the role of developers, software engineers, and data scientists? Well, that's what I wanted to take a look at in this video. So. I applied for the beta. And yesterday, I got this email back. So we're gonna go and check it out. Ready to do it? Let's get to it. And so it begins. This is the page which announced OpenAI Codex. So through here, you can actually see that Codex is in fact the model that powers GitHub Copilot. So again, they actually built it in collaboration with GitHub. Now, if you wanted to try to get access to this, you can join the wait list. Now, I don't know what the wait times are like. So I think I applied about a week ago and I was able to get access kind of relatively quickly. So I, I also applied for GPT-3 access a while ago and that took a little bit of time. But in this case, Codex was actually reasonably quick. Now, the cool thing as well is that you can also go and read the paper. So if you wanted to go and take a look, at the fundamentals and the mathematics behind the code, you can actually head over to AXRV or A R A A R X I V. So in this particular case, you can actually get the entire code. And again, as I was saying, so the cool thing is that it is, or it does mention that GPT-3 is specifically fine-tuned for synthesizing code from doc strings. And it looks like in this particular case, it's able to solve or build functional code around about 28.8% of the time, which is what we're gonna dig into a little bit now. And ideally the aim is to take a look at how this could work collaboratively with developers, but just as easily, we wanna take a look to see whether or not this is going to replace us completely. So let's first up take a look at what GPT-3 in general can do. Now, again, if you haven't seen much on GPT-3, basically it's a massive model with a ton of parameters, which allows the model to actually do a lot of stuff when it comes to natural language processing. So say, for example, you wanted to do translation or pass unstructured data or uh, convert movies to emojis. This is the type of stuff that GPT-3 really does excel at. Now, in this particular case, we're going to focus on OpenAI Codex, which is the fine-tuned version, which specifically is for generating code. Now, once you do get access to the beta, you're able to actually go to the playground. So in this case, the link for this is beta.openai.com forward slash playground, and you're basically able to log in to be able to trial this out. Now, to use the specific codex version or the codex model, you actually need to go over to here and specify that you want to use DaVinci Codex. So you can see that this is the most capable model in the codex series, 
which can understand and generate code, including translating natural language to code. Now, this is the core thing. It is converting natural language to code. So we can pass through a natural language prompt. So do this or loop five times over this, and it's going to try to generate the associated code for that particular prompt. This is what it's referring to when it actually talks about converting doc strings to functional code or functional models. So what are we going to do? The nice thing about this is you're also able to choose your language. So down here, we can see that we can either convert to bash, C sharp, Go, Java, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, Rust, SQL, and TypeScript. We're going to choose Python in this particular case. So say, for example, we wanted to, um, let's say we just wanted to print out something. So uh, print out, let's make it a comment, print out, hello world. So what we can do is we can pass through our prompt, which you can see over there. And then right down the bottom, we can hit submit. And this will ideally try to do something. And there you go. So this is actually gone and generated the code to print hello world. Again, super simple example, but you can see there that I've written, I've put in a comment. So comment or pound sign print at hello world. And it's actually gone and written print hello world. So if I took this and threw it into a Jupyter notebook, you can see that it is in fact printing out hello world. So really easily well really quickly we're able to see that it is generating functional code now let's go and try a different example so say for example we wanted to um uh, bring in pandas so say so pandas is a really popular tabular data set or tabular library which allows you to work with tabular data sets so specifically csvs or um, anything that think of it is, as being in a table so uh, say you had a sql extract or an excel sheet pandas is the library for that so if i hit submit oh so this is actually gone way further ahead so this is actually gone let's take a look at what it's written there so i've given it the prompt bring in pandas and oh it's actually gone and finished it and written and numpy libraries so it's now gone and written import pandas as pd which is i believe is correct syntax import numpy as mp it's then also gone and created a data frame so a fundamental concept when working with pandas is a data frame. So think of this as just a big tabular data set. It's uh, if you've ever worked with pivot tables, it's like pivot table on steroids. So we could actually take this code and try to execute it. So if I grab this and throw it into my notebook, let's see if this works. Again, no errors. I don't know how many times I've written code without errors. This is obviously a simple example, but this is AI literally writing our Python code, which is pretty sick. Now, if we went and took a look at this data frame, let's actually see if it actually understands how to view the data frame. So um, the correct function that it would output if we were to try to view the first five rows of this data frame would be the appending the head method to this DF uh, object over here. So if I wrote show first five rows, of data frame. Hit submit. That is crazy. So you can see there that it is actually outputting df.head. So that's the method that I was referring to. Now it's actually going further down and writing out a whole bunch of stuff. So it's showing the last five rows, it's creating summary statistics, it's creating a new data frame or the beginning of a new data frame. So if I actually went and copied this, this is almost doing like our exploratory data analysis for us, which if you're a or not a data scientist or not a software engineer this makes your life a ton easier so describe is going to be the summary statistics so if we wanted to just view the first five rows of our data frame pretty cool right so if we did the tail function that it generated that's working and if we also went and ran describe so this is also generating our summary statistics so already we can see that this is generating code now what happens if we gave it a bit of a broader example? So say we cleared all of this and let's say we just gave it the beginnings of a machine learning model. So say, for example, we wanted to build a machine learning model, machine learning model for classification. Make this a little bit bigger. All right. So build a machine learning model for classification and let's give it a first couple of lines of code. So import pandas as PD. So one of the most popular libraries when it comes to Python for classification is going to be the library called scikit-learn. So if we went and hit submit, let's see what it generates. So it's actually bringing in a data set. So raw GitHub user, con 
Where's that data coming from? Doesn't look like that's a valid link by the looks of it. Not found. Yeah. Okay, so that's our first fall down. But again, it's... Oh, wait. It actually went and finished the line. That is pretty cool. So it's actually gone and ridden... Let's actually take a look at this link there. Uh, in this particular case, it's looking like that one's not found. Ah, you win some, you lose some. Now, the key thing is that right now we're limiting how much information or how many lines of code it can write. So if we actually drop, let's go back to basics. So import pandas is PD. And let's tune our response length over here. So if we actually made this a little bit longer, so let's give it some more degrees of freedom. So we can tune our response length, our temperature, and think of temperature as controlling the creativity of the model. So um, you've got the ability to tune that up and down. Uh, top P allows you to choose how many options you choose from the next sequence. So basically it's like limiting how much, limiting or opening up how many options it can generate for the next sequence within our string of text or block of text. Um, we've also got a frequency penalty and a presence penalty. We'll come back to that in a second. Let's actually try this out now. So we've, what we've gone and done is we've left it as the same engine. We've just gone and changed the response length. So if we went and expanded this out, so it looks like it's importing a bunch of different libraries. This is nuts, guys. It is actually writing the code to go on ahead and build a machine learning model. Now, I don't know where it's getting this data set from, but this looks like it's bringing it in from a person's C drive. So you might need to sub that out. And I don't know where you'd actually go and get that data, but this is actually looking reasonable. So it's bringing in a number of libraries, which is here. It's going and bringing in a data set. This is exactly what, or pretty much the same style of code that I'd actually go and write if I were to go and try to generate a model myself. Um, it's showing the first five rows. It's dropping a column. It's checking whether or not we've got null values. It's performing some value counts. So again, this is almost like an automated data scientist. Now, I don't know if this is going to be perfect, but you can start to see that it's actually able to generate code pretty successfully without too many errors. So if I went and brought in this section, so this is probably going to fail because I'm not going to have this particular data set. Um, so if I brought in this, let's get rid of all these lines that we went and generated. Uh, so I'd need to go and install that library. So pip install matplotlib. Let's make this a bit bigger. So that's installed. So if we went and ran this now, no module named Seaborn, so we can install Seaborn. So these are visualization libraries. And, and scikit-learn. <laughs> uh, what is it? sklearn. How do we install scikit-learn again? scikit-learn, install. Can't remember if it's scikit-learn or sklearn. scikit-learn, cool. So if we go and run this, that is successfully running that code. So it's at least doing a successful import of a bunch of machine learning libraries. Pretty cool, right? So that sort of gives you an idea of what's possible uh, with OpenAI Codex. Now, this is really focused on Python. So how might we do this if you wanted to do something slightly different? So say you're more of a software engineer, you're building websites and things of that like. Well, again, the nice thing about the OpenAI sandbox or playground that you get is that you've also got a JavaScript sandbox. So you can see that up there, Codex JavaScript sandbox. And this allows you to write JavaScript code and actually have it rendered inside of this screen here. Now, the cool thing about this is that you can actually bring in links. So say, for example, I wanted to show a picture of uh, Rick and Morty, right? So I had this picture here. Uh, looks like it's downloading. Um, how do we view it? So let's actually open it up. So this is the picture. So say, for example, I wanted a picture of Rick inside of my website. Now, typically you'd have to use like source tags and bring it into your HTML. And you'd have to write that from scratch unless you were using some sort of framework or you're using Dreamweaver. I don't know how old Dreamweaver is now, but you'd have to do that type of thing. What we can do with Codex is actually get it to try to write that code for us. So um, say, for example, right down here in this prompt down the bottom, 
I can write, let's make this a bit bigger, see if we can see it. That's way better. Okay. So I can write uh, show me uh, or display, actually display a picture of this. Or actually, yeah, whatever. Let's try that. You can see that it is actually showing. So this is like our template website, right? It's actually creating a variable. It's creating a element to hold our image. And then it's actually applying our image to the page. So it's actually passed through that URL. And that was nothing, but all I wrote was this. So display a picture of this, and it's actually starting to generate the code for that website. So pretty, pretty cool, right? Now, let's say that we wanted to make it smaller. Um, we could type make it smaller. And you can see that it's gone and made it way smaller. Um, I don't know, what's another one? Uh, make it twice as big. And it's gone and made it big. I don't know, I'm like a kid in a playground. So this is actually allowing you to pass through natural language commands and create a website. So from a software engineering perspective, again, the, you're probably not going to write repeatable code like this, or this, these are repeating themselves. But you can start to see that this could be potentially very, very powerful when it comes to allowing you to quickly make changes to your code and fine tune your code. Say, for example, we wanted to change the background, um, set background color to black. Um, move picture to center. So it's kind of centered it there. <laughs> Centering is always a nightmare. Add a title called Rick and Morty's page. So you can see that over here, it is generating all of this code. Uh, let's it's created a h1 element um set h set title to white so we can see it that is pretty cool guys so you can see that all i'm doing is i'm passing through some natural language commands and it is actually going on ahead and actually generating the code to be able to do that so you could probably take away this code you probably need to clean it up a little bit but it is actually generating the JavaScript that we can use within our website. So we could also export this to JS Fiddle if we wanted to try it out. But that gives you an idea of how powerful the Codex model is. So we are just passing through natural language commands and it is generating the code for us. Now, say for example, you wanted to use it more in a pipeline style of approach. Well, you can also write it or write work with it using the Python API. So I'm going to delete all this stuff that we started doing. So we can actually access it using the OpenAI library. So there's an OpenAI library that's available through OpenAI that allows you to tap in to the Codex model. So in order to do that, we first up need to install OpenAI. So I'm just going to write exclamation mark, pip install OpenAI. And I've already got it installed. And then what we can do is import this into our notebook. So import open AI and then so what I've written is exclamation mark pip install open AI and then I've gone and imported it into our notebook so import open AI and all this code will be available in the description below if you want to try it out but you do need an API key that is a key thing to call out then what we can do is actually set that API key so I've gone and stored this outside of this notebook so I don't sort of share these APIs and uh, hit my bandwidth limits too quick so we can bring this in. So from constants, import API key. And then what we need to do in order to actually work with OpenAI through our notebook is we need to set the API key. So we can do this using openai.api underscore key, and we set it equal to our API key. So that basically means that we've now effectively authenticated it against the OpenAI API or Python SDK. So we can actually start using the codex model through our own python code so it's almost like writing python to write python <laughs> we're kind of getting a little bit meta here so let's actually go and see if we can actually write some or get our codex model to do some stuff so i'm going to create a variable called prompts 
And the cool thing about this is that you can not only get it to generate code, but also fix your code, which I think is going to be super, super useful for software developers around the world. Because more often than not, you're going to probably write some code and there'll maybe be a bit of a bug in it. So having the ability to sort of like side check your code using something like this could potentially be very, very useful. At the moment, based what I'm seeing, it's probably not going to completely replace software developers, which is why I think GitHub was pretty intelligent in calling it Copilot and not like new pilot or revised pilot or AI pilot. It really is going to sort of act like a Copilot. Now, if you let's actually try to get it to, to fix our code. So remember that we can import pandas into our notebook uh, using import pandas as pd right so let's say we went and screwed up our code so what we can do is say uh, fix this code fix this code and i'm actually going to write the incorrect code so let's actually have a line break and then i'm going to write import or let's actually write imm port pandas ask pd so we know that this is actually incorrect so if we go and print out that prompt Let's call it prompt, not prompts. So this is definitely not correct or not grammatically or syntactically correct from a Python perspective. So it should be 1M and it should be as PD, not ask PD. So what we can do is what we can try to do is see if Codex is able to fix this code. So not just generate new code, but actually fix our code. So let's try this. So what we can do is we can use the completion API through Codex. So we're going to store the response inside a variable called response. And then I'm going to set it equal to openai.completion.create. And then there's a couple of parameters that we need to pass through to this. So if I write openai.completion.create and hit question mark, question mark. So there are a bunch of arguments that we can pass through to this. It doesn't look like it actually specifies them there. That's fine. Let's actually go and take a look at them ourselves. So the first parameter that we need to set is the engine that we want to use. And in this case, we want to use the codex model, right? So the engine is going to be DaVinci dash codex. And then the second keyword argument that we want to set is, let's just tab this in a bit. Second keyword argument that we want to go on ahead and set is uh, the prompt So prompt equals uh we're setting it equal to this prompt over here so think as the prompt as the natural language text that we're going to be passing through to codex so no different to how we played it around or played around with it inside of our playground we can pass through our prompt using the python sdk so this basically means that we're going to be passing through this so fix this code and then a line break and then import pandas ask pd so we're going to be passing through that to the codex model then I can add a comma and then we've got a bunch of keyword arguments that sort of allow us to fine tune what our responses are going to look like. So these are temperature and we're going to set this to zero for now and think of oh, zero and think of this as influencing the model's ability to take risk. So this is our risk taking ability and it sort of influences the creativity of the model. So influences creativity. Right, so a higher number is going to give us more creativity. I believe a higher number is going to give us more creativity. Hit me up in the comments below if that is not right. Um, we've also got the ability to pass through another keyboard parameter, which is top P. And this gives us uh, a range of... So the way these models work is by generating a single line or generating a token and think of a token as a word. And what it actually does is it uses a technique called sampling to work out which next token to pass through. So if it... Uh, writes import first, then we need to determine what the next token is going to be. So top P influences how we actually go about sampling. So this is influencing, influencing sampling. And then we've also got a bunch of penalties that we can apply as well. So we've got a frequency penalty. And we're going to set that to 0, 0. .0. And this, what does this influence? Uh, this provides penalties for repeated tokens so it basically means that if it starts to or it stops the model from repeating itself over and over so a key thing about these huge nlp models is that sometimes when you go and generate stuff they're going to start repeating themselves because those next set of tokens have a really high probability of being the most appropriate token we don't want it to just continuously repeat itself 
This is one of the key advantages of this particular model is that we can apply this frequency penalty to tell it to don't just repeat yourself, actually try to generate new stuff. Now we can also pass through a presence penalty. And this is also going to influence it to uh, have new words, right? So we want it to go and generate new stuff. So the presence penalty is looking to see whether or not it is applying new tokens. So new tokens, uh, penalties or new words. Uh, and then we've also got the ability to stop it. So this is almost like early stopping. So stop equals, and then we're going to apply a pound symbol. So the stop keyword argument is basically telling our model when to stop, when to stop generating stuff. Now, because we're coding in Python, we basically want it to stop at the next comment. So by passing through this pound symbol, we're basically saying, hey, once you reach the next comment within your generated text or generated sequence, stop generating stuff as of then. Now, what we can actually do is we can actually go and run this. So let's quickly take a look at what we wrote. So we're going to be storing everything inside of a variable called response. And in order to do this, we're writing openai.completion in capitals dot create. So this is using the create method as part of our completion API. And then we're passing through a bunch of different keyword parameters. So we're setting the engine and this allows us to use the codex model. If you wanted to use the baseline DaVinci model or the baseline GPT-3 model, it's going to be just DaVinci. And then we are passing through our prompt, which is going to be this over here. We're setting a number of keyword parameters as well. So these are almost like tuning. So if you wanted to drop all of these, you could. You don't actually need to have these. In fact, let's actually comment these out and run it first. So if we just pass through our prompt, and I'm just going to delete this little comma here and run this, we can actually take a look at our generated code. Let's actually go to step three. So if I go and print out response, or let's actually type, take a look at our response. Uh, you can see that what it's going and generating is backward slash n data URL, something, something weird. So that's not exactly the best response. So if I type in dot uh, choices and grab the first value dot text, you can see that that isn't exactly completing our code all that well. So these fine tuning parameters are super important, right? So that's what it's gone and written as this second line of code. Now we can actually go and try to tune this a little bit. So rather than doing that, let's go and unlock our tuning parameters. And we've got, we just got to add a comma there. And you can see this is generating way better results. So it's actually gone and fine tuned or fixed up our code. So we've written fix this code and then we've written immun purport pandas ask PD. And it's return import pandas as PD. So if I went and tried to run this line of code first up, you can see that's giving us invalid syntax because this isn't right. But if we went and ran this or these two lines of code, you can see that these are valid. So this is where I think that there is a huge opportunity. So in terms of fine tuning your code or almost using it like a pair programmer, I think that this is super, super cool. Now, let's say, for example, we wanted to generate some code. So rather than asking it to fix our code, let's say we just wanted to create a loop that, uh, I don't know, prints out my name five times. So we could write, um, write a loop that prints out Nick five times. So let's try this. So this is almost like a slightly different approach to using the codex model. So rather than passing through fix our code, we're now asking it to generate something. So if we run this prompt, so this is just what our prompt looks like. We can actually delete this. If we went and ran this response now or tried this response, doesn't look like we've got anything back. Write a loop. Let's try something slightly different. So write a function that prints out Nick five times. And we need to set the number of tokens as well. So right now it's probably written the commencement of this. So def print underscore Nick underscore five times. And it looks kind of promising, but this isn't giving us enough scope. So what we can actually do is we can set the max number of tokens as well. So if I write max underscore tokens, 
and set this to uh, 1024. So this is going to limit how long our response or our output can be. So if I run this and take a look, so that is our function there now. So like that is our function. Right, so it's gone, we've created a function. So def print underscore nick underscore five underscore times. And if I actually go and run this function, so print underscore nick underscore five underscore times, it's printing out nick five times. How cool is that? So it is actually doing what we're asking it to do. So we could also say uh, print it 10 times. Let's tr change that now. So in this particular case, it's actually gone and written def print underscore nick underscore 10 times, print nick times 10, and then let's actually see how this works. So in this particular case, it has not gone and separated it out onto a new line, but it's definitely printed out nick 10 times. So um, let's say on different lines. Take a look at this. So it is actually fine tuning this code. So this is the first code, right? I, I'm getting so excited. This is just so cool. So uh, this first code is just printing out Nick 10 times on a single line. And we went and fine tuned our statement to say, write a function that prints out Nick 10 times on different lines. And it's gone and fine tuned this function. So if we went and copied this now and ran this down here, give us uh, ourselves some more room. How cool is that? So this is actually, so it's actually gone and written the function to print underscore Nick underscore 10 underscore times. And it's actually written a for loop to print out Nick 10 times. So you can see it's gone and written it all down there. So in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Pretty cool, right? Like I think that that is absolutely ridiculously awesome. Now, what we could also do is let's say if we wanted to give it something a little bit more general. So um, what's a good example? So say we wanted to uh, bring in some data, right? So I've got this data set inside of my folder called, uh, I think it was titanic.csv. Let's just take a look. Yep, so titanic. So let's say, for example, we wanted to import this into our notebook. So I could write um, import titanic.csv into a pandas data frame. Let's see if this works. So what the prompt that we're going to be passing through this time is import titanic.csv into a pandas data frame. So if we ran and ran this, try our response. Take a look at that. So it is actually doing it. So we've written titanic underscore df equals pd dot read underscore csv. So I know for a fact this is correct syntax. So if we went and copied this now, assuming we have pandas, right? So this is probably going to fail if we don't have pandas imported. On well, this particular, oh, we already imported it. Remember when we were generating that code. So we can actually go, let's see if we can um, view the first five rows. View first five rows of titanic.csv data frame. No way. So it obviously doesn't, let's uh, write titanic. So in this particular case, what it's going to generate it is just titanic.head because we haven't really given it the name of the data frame. So it doesn't have context right now. So if we wrote titanic underscore df data frame, take a look at that. So it's actually writing the code for us. So if we went and copied this, that is showing us the first five rows. So if you didn't necessarily know how to write this code to do certain things for this data frame, this would actually help you. So say, for example, we wanted to drop this column, right? Let's actually go, the, the appropriate function will be um, titanic underscore df dot drop. You pass through the column and then you set axis equal to one. So it would look something like this. Let's see if it would actually write the code. So it will be titanic underscore df dot drop and then it will be passenger ID comma axis equals one. So that would drop that column, All right? So that's what I've written. So let's say Nick's code let's see what it actually goes and generates so um we're gonna say drop passenger let's just make sure we name it right passenger id column from data frame 
if this works, this would be so cool. So, all right, so the syntax is slightly different, but this is still going to work. So this is really, really cool. So if we go and it's actually gone and reset the data frame. So if we go and copy this, let's say compare our code. So this is the code that I wrote. And keep in mind that this, my code is actually just doing it in place. So we actually are not applying it and saving it. We're just doing it and it's going to return the result. What this is doing is it's actually going and reshaping the data frame and it's resetting it without that dropped column. So if I went, but you'll actually see that if I go and line them up, these are almost identical. The only difference is that it has gone and wrapped the columns inside of square brackets, which is just an extension of the syntax. So it's exactly, it's perfectly correct. So if we go and run this code now and take a look at our data frame, Titanic, you can see that it's gone and dropped the passenger ID column. Pretty cool, right? Now, you're probably thinking, well, Nick, so is this just going to take my job? Is this going to completely replace our data scientists? Well, let's put ourselves in like the real hot seat. So say, for example, um, your customer came to you and said, hey, I want a machine learning model that does classification for this data frame. So let's take a look. So again, this is not going to have any context. So build a classification model on Titanic underscore DF data frame. And what we're going to do is we're going to extend out the maximum number of tokens. So rather than having 1,024, let's give it 2,048. So if we went and pass through this prompt, ran this response, and took a look at what it's generated. So you can see that it hasn't actually gone and generated anything there. Now um, we could give it a slightly different prompt uh, using scikit-learn. And you can see it's only generated a dot. So I think a key thing or a key limitation with this is the breadth of code that you're passing it through. So if you're not giving it a whole heap of prompts, it's probably going to struggle a little bit. Now, if we said um, slightly, you know, reshape this slightly differently. Uh, so uh, let's say build a regression model. All right. So we're not giving it any context and we go and pass through this prompt. So you can see it's it's going finishing this. So with the best parameters, it's going and instantiating a linear regression. So this is correct, right? So this is actually appropriately starting up a linear regression model. It's then going and specifying or passing through the fit model. So again, you're able, I think it's really, really good if you've got like really defined code blocks for what you want to do. And if you want to iteratively build stuff, but a key thing is that, so think of this like a great ship. You're still going to want a captain to ideally help steer it. That is, I think, the key takeaway from this. It's a great sidekick that you can have above your shoulder to help check your code. And it's great for helping you build smaller prompts of code. But in terms of the bigger grand scheme of things, you're going to at least want to provide it a little bit of direction. That being said, it is freaking cool, guys. Like you've seen what it's been able to generate from this so it's able to generate a bunch of code we've taken a look at python we've also taken a look at javascript as well and that about wraps it up thanks again for tuning in peace thanks so much for tuning in guys hopefully you enjoyed this video if you did be sure to give it a big thumbs up hit subscribe and tick that bell thanks again for tuning in peace